We can get started. Third lesson of the day, data binding. Now we will dive a little bit deeper into data binding. Do we have any open questions from the previous lesson? It isn't that complicated. If you understand it and if you get this shown, and I think that should be fine. So with that, we can dive a little bit deeper into more features of data binding. This is our current application. We have the current car. The current car is displayed, as you can see here, graphically. We have the title and the description, and we now see, beautifully, the, the layout of our application. And I would like to go on with these two buttons, with the next and the previous button, okay? Good, let's do that. To add a button handler, now it's, it's pretty simple. You just go into the button. That's a repetition. I showed you that already. You simply type click, enter, enter, and you got your button click handler. You can use the function key F12 to directly jump to the button handler. And if you don't like the name of the function, which I don't like, button click is not very nice name here. Control RR for rename on previous. Now, what can we do here? First, we need the index of the current car in our list. So what we do is we say var current car index equals to cars dot. There is a method which is called find index current car. It's kind of useful because find index should, oh, sorry, not find index. I'm sorry, my mistake, oh, um, index off, this is what I meant. Sorry, sorry, my mistake. Index off. Index off gives, gives us the index of the current car inside of the cars. Now, this is the on previous button. We have to check if current car index greater than zero if it is greater than zero, then we can do what? We can simply say current car equals cars current car index minus one. That is not a very complicated algorithm. And hopefully it will do the trick. Spoiler alert, it will not. It will not work, okay? But that is by design. We have to fix that bug. Let's do the same for the on next. Okay, so go into the button. Let's practice that again. Click and enter. Press F12. Rename the method on next. And finally, we copy the whole stuff here. And of course, if we have next, we need to change the, the test here. We need to say the current car index must be smaller than cars dot count minus one. And then we can say plus one. Now, in, in, in this situation, we have a little bit of a code repetition going on because as you can see, here you have the index off, here you have the index off, you have to check you have the changing of the current car. So what we could spend some time in, maybe we could have a helper function which does the, the common operation, but that's not the point here. I think you get the idea. So if we run it now, please try to run the application. And if you run the application and you press next, what happens? Nothing. Why? If I set a breakpoint here in on next, let's do that. And if I click next, it really goes into the method. You see it? If I take a look at the current car, the current car is the police car. You see it here? It's the police car. But if you take a look, if you take a look at the UI here, let's continue here. If I take a look at the UI, we don't see the police car. We still see the Ferrari. Not a good idea. 
what could go what, what could have gone wrong why doesn't it show the changes of the ui and now comes a very important point there is a reason for that and here WPF and XAML data binding works differently compared to Angular. You have learned in Angular that you just need to do the data binding and everything happens magically. Harry Potter programming. So Angular recognizes automatically if a variable value changes and refreshes the UI accordingly. Many UI technologies do that. That is super useful from the viewpoint of the developer but it also has a big, big drawback. You know what this drawback is? Performance. Because if the UI want to give you that, wants to give you that feature, it needs to constantly monitor whether something has changed and update the UI whenever it thinks that something might have changed. From a performance standpoint, it would be way better if the user interface would be passive and you as the developer you know inside of your application when your state of the application has changed and when the ui should be refreshed and then you could poke the user interface layer and say hey user interface i changed something please refresh the screen that is not so convenient as a programmer but from a performance standpoint it's way better by the way you can turn Angular into exactly that mode too. And if you are a professional Angular developer, you typically switch Angular into that mode for larger applications because of performance reasons. So Angular is kind of Harry Potter-like programming, a little bit of fairy dust, everything works, but performance isn't great by, def by default. It's okay for small applications but it's not perfect for very large applications. In XAML, things are a little bit different. In XAML, you have to explicitly poke the UI and tell the UI something has changed. Now, how do we do that? There is an interface for that. Please go up to the class here, to the main window class, and add a very famous interface. I notify property changed. I notify property changed. Notify property changed means the main window has the capability to notify the user interface that a property has changed. I notify property changed. You will hear me saying that interface very frequently in the upcoming weeks. I notify property changed. And if you have an exam, maybe because the I don't know, maybe some of you um, have problems with the written exam and you have an oral exam with me. It might happen that I ask you for this interface. I notify property changed. Now, what can that interface do? Let's implement the interface. You see, you have the red squigglies here. Just use the light bulb here, implement interface. It will give you the necessary code. Just click on it. This interface consists of a single event. You have to raise this event you have to fire this event whenever a property has changed. It's a contract between the user interface and your code. Your code has to raise this event and then the user interface will change the UI. Clear? Yeah. Good. Let's give it a try. When should we raise the event? Well, we could, for instance, raise it here after changing the current car, right? It works like this. You say property changed, question mark dot. You know why we say question mark dot? Question mark means raise this event if somebody is interested in this event. Okay? It's just to make sure. If currently nobody is interested and listening for property changes, we don't get an error. Just to make sure, we say question mark point. Invoke. Who is the sender? Well, that's me. I am sending the event, so this. And what am I going to send? So-called property changed event args. And these property changed event args, the only argument that you have to pass in here is the name of the property that has changed. And in our situation, what has changed? Current car. So we say name of current. 
current car. And that's it. That's the poking of the user interface, telling WPF, hey WPF, a property has changed. The property with the name current car. And by telling WPF exactly that, WPF knows that it has to go through all its bindings and refresh the user interface for all bindings which depend on current car. Understandable? Okay, so let's copy this line and put it into the previous button too, so we have it in both directions, and then run the app and see what's going to happen. So as you can see, this is a little bit different compared to... Ah, okay, the meeting was short interruption here. Crossing fingers, next. You see, we are now again inside our handler, and if I let it run, I get the police car. Nice. And if I go to the next one, I get the... It fetches the, the image uh, from the internet, and currently the internet isn't that great. It works. Does it work for you too? So what should you remember? WPF does not automatically refresh the screen if property changes. If properties change. If properties have changed, you have to invoke the I notify property change dot property changed event and tell the event what properties have changed. It might happen that multiple property changes change at the same time and therefore you have to add multiple of these calls, but that's a different story. Now, you see, this line here isn't very beautiful because now you have this line here and you have exactly the same line here. Wouldn't it be nicer if we could somehow automate the calling of property change dot invoke whenever this property really changes? And of course you can do that. Please take a look at the code that I'm writing now and follow accordingly. We will change the auto implemented property here and do the following. We'll say private car current car value then I will change the implementation of the getter and the setter. The getter here should just return current car value. It's the getter of the property and the setter should say current car value equals value that is changing the value and then we move this line up here and with this slight little change we don't need to explicitly call the property change down here we can remove it this is a very, very typical way of implementing a property which is data bound in WPF. You will need that in the upcoming weeks over and over and over and over. So it is a good idea to remember the location of the code that we wrote today. I already have put it in the GitHub repository of the course, so you can look it up from there too, because you will need it very, very frequently. Whenever the current car changes, we automatically call the property change invoke method to tell WPF the property has changed, update the bindings. Are you ready for the next step for the next data binding scenario? This will kind of blow your mind, believe me. I have not, I'm not sure if you have ever seen something like this. The next thing that I would like to implement with you is another data binding scenario because this time I would like to fill the combo box. See here, the combo box with all the cars where I can jump directly to a specific car is currently empty. How can we fill the combo box with a list of cars? How can we do that? Can anybody remember how you would do something similar in Angular? There is a very special binding, the star, star ng4, does that ring a bell? Yeah, NG4 binding, the so-called structural NG4 binding. That would be how you have done it in, in Angular. In XAML, it's even simpler. 
Because in XAML, controls like that one, the combo box, they are so-called items controls. Items controls mean they cannot just contain a single element, but they can add, they can display a lot of elements. A list box would be an items control. A data grid would be an items control. A combo box would be an items control. Every element that can display multiple child elements is a so-called items control. And guess what? There is a property which is called items source. See that one? And here we can just specify a binding. We can just say binding cars. That's it. If we have an element that can display multiple things, we just use a binding. Not like in Angular, the complex thing where you have a different syntax for a single binding and a different syntax for a structural binding with ng4. Just use a binding. If we run it, it is not perfect yet, but we should already see something. So if you run it, you will see, haha, we already have three cars. But currently, WPF does not need to know, uh, does not know how to display a car. So what does it do? It calls to string on every object and that gives me the name of the class. That's not very interesting, right? But we already did the binding. So that's really simple. Some things in XAML are more difficult than in Angular, but some things in XAML are simpler than in Angular. And this is such a case. Luckily, there is an additional property which is called display member path where we can choose the name of the property which should be displayed and in our case it's name name of the car please in the combo box display the name of the car if i run it display member path if i run it i get see ferrari police lamborghini so what do you need to remember from that example? A combo box is an items control. What is an items control? A control that can display and contain multiple child elements. If you would like to do a binding, just bind on item source. And in the case of the combo box, you just choose the property that should be displayed with display member path. Got it? Very simple, isn't it? We, ha we, didn't, we didn't have to write a single line of C-sharp code for that. It just works. But now comes the difficult part. We want, if we run the code, whenever the user chooses the combo box, for instance, police, we would like, like, we would like to switch to police. If the user selects Lambo, we want to go to Lamborghini. If the user selects Ferrari, we want to go to Ferrari. What do you think? How could we solve that? Any ideas? The same thing as a click event. So your idea is, could there be an event, something like selection changed and there is one, but don't choose it because your intuition is correct to a certain degree. But if you understand data binding, you don't need that. Now comes the magic part. Please just follow along and then we'll, then we'll think about why this magically works. Please do the following. Selected item binding current car. Huh? And run your app. Selected item binding current car. Take a look at my screen, it already works. No selection changed event, no code to write. Why does it work? What could that be? Can anybody guess from the context what this selected item binding current car does? Exactly, it is a data binding, but this time it's not a data binding from C sharp into XAML, but it is a data binding in the opposite direction. 
whatever you choose in the combo box is written back to C sharp. And if the current card is changed by the combo box, the other uh, data binding expressions, especially this one, and this one, and this one, fire automatically. So by changing your current card through the combo box, everything else is implemented automatically, is refreshed automatically. So your idea was correct. You could have reacted on the selected item changed uh, event, write some C sharp code, try to find out what the new selection is, change the current car manually, but you would have to write a lot of C sharp code for that. And with that, we don't need that. Because we have different ways of binding. That is a binding, here one, from C sharp to the user interface. And that one, this one, is a binding from the user interface into C sharp. And all we did is we smartly connected both binding mechanisms. Do you like that? I find that really, really smart. So we have only a few things left what we want to do in this example, because now we have, let's do a quick inventory check here. We have, come on, the graphical display of the car, check. We have the buttons, next, works, previous, works. We have the combo box, it's filled. We can choose, this works too. The only thing that doesn't work yet is this one. So the last thing that we need to do is we need to provide the edit form. And that is a new one. I would like to show you how you implement a very, very simple dialog window. Please follow along. Right click on the project and add a new WPF window. I will call it edit car window. Good. Please change the size of the window. Of the window. Uh, we will change it 350 and the width should be, I don't know, 450, something like this. And maybe the title, edit car. Something like this. Now we could implement this whole XAML stuff. We could again think about the grid, we could do some styling and so on but it would be exactly the same as we did in the first hour today. So I want to spare you that. I will share again a little bit of code with you because I've prepared this code and we will focus on the things which are really different. So what I will give you is this part of the code and I will use Discord again to send the code to you, okay? So please copy this code and put it here instead of the grid in the window. And it will give you a kind of design that looks like this, where you have the title on the top, a larger description window here in the middle, and a close button here below. And if you take a look how I implemented it, very simple, we have three rows, the first one is auto, that's the title text box. The last one is auto, that's the close button. And the area in the middle is filled with the text box. And there we have a text box, another text box, and a button. For now, to get things running, please remove the on close click here. Before we do anything else, I would like to show you how you can trigger a dialog window in WPF. It's really simple. We will go into the main window.xaml. Please go into the main window.xaml, look for your edit button here, and add a click event. Click. By now, you should know how to add a click event. F12 to go to the method, rename it, control RR on edit and this is how you launch a dialogue in WPF. 
You simply say var dialog equals to new edit car window, something like this, dialog.show dialog. This is what you do. It's as simple as that. If you did it correctly and you run the app, then you can click on the edit button and the edit button should bring up the edit car window. Let's see. Here, edit button and it brings up, as you can see here, the edit car window. Currently the close button does nothing because we haven't implemented any, code, any logic here. We have to use the X here in the right upper corner remove it and we can open it again and I think you get the idea. Let's implement the closing. Please go into the edit car window and now we add the click button here again. We practice that. New event handler. Enter. F12. Go to definition. Rename the button click to on close. And how do you close a window in WPF? Very simple. You just say hide. If you did it correctly, you can run the app again. You should be able to click on the edit button. And if you hit close, the dialog should disappear. And it should really be a dialog. So as long as this dialog is up here, you cannot do anything in the background window. That is called a modal dialog. It is blocking the rest of the UI. I have to get rid of the dialog in order to be able to manipulate the, the main window again. Now, how can we get the current car's name and description into the edit window? Here is currently our on edit button. Who has an idea? I give you a tip. I told you that in WPF we have the possibility to set the so-called data context. Can you remember what the data context was? The data context was the object that where WPF looks for when resolving bindings. And if you take a look at the edit car window, you will see that we have some bindings here. You see that one and that one? name, description, does that ring a bell to you? These are properties of which class? Car. Car, right. In the main window, where do we store the car which is currently selected? In a property named? Current car, Current car. right. Can you bring these things together? We have the current car in the main window, we have the data binding expressions here in the edit car window. Couldn't we simply say dialog dot data context equals current car? Do you get the idea? I just tell WPF, hey, here is a window and the bindings all refer to the current car. If I run this guy, and I click on the edit button, guess what? Everything is filled. Try to change the name. I don't know, from Ferrari to Fur. Hit the close button, and guess what? It already works. The comment box updated automatically because we are manipulating the objects in memory. We don't need to write a single line of code in order to fill some input boxes or read the values of input boxes or whatever. With data binding, we can simply bind the UI controls to our so-called view model that we have in C-sharp. And that saves us so much code to write. Old style UI programs, which I have seen over and over and over again, they are full of code where people write manual code in C Sharp to take code, uh, to take objects from C Sharp and manually set the context of the user interface. And then again, they write code to extract the values from the user interface and copy them into memory in C Sharp. Why? It's simply not necessary. This is why data binding was invented. 
I can now go to the police car and change that one. I don't know, police car. Click on close and it works properly. If I change something here, it works. See? Exactly what I wanted to show you. Now what you need to understand is here, you need to understand what the data context is. This data context here makes sure that these bindings here are relative to the data context. So the description is resolved by taking a look at the data context. The data context is the current car and therefore we edit the current car. We have a bunch of bugs in this, in this application. It's not perfect. We could structure it much better, but we currently want to focus on, um, on the data binding scenarios. Nice. Do you like this kind of programming, this programming model? Works nicely, doesn't it? Hmm? Really nice. Give me a second. I just recognized a mistake here in my code. Give me just one sec. I made a mistake. I'm sorry for that. I told you that you should use the hide method to close the dialog, but this is not a good idea. If you have a modal dialog, please use the close method. That was wrong. I told you something wrong. I had, I don't know what I thought. It was just a mistake of mine. So please forget what I told you about the hide method. Use the close method and you're good. Okay. Sorry for that. Nice, nice. Now let's quickly summarize what we did in order to make sure that we really keep in mind what we learned today. What were the new things which we covered today? First, in the main window, we had simple bind expressions, these things here. The bindings are relative to what? To the data context. Therefore, if we take a look here, we set the data context to any object that we want. In our case, it's just the main window, but we could add anything here. It's just the source for bindings. This is what we do here. This was the first thing that we learned. Markup extension binding, and it's relative to the data context. The next thing, which was new, that we learned today, was binding of, you see it here, an items control. Let's maybe dive into that a little bit more. So if I go here and if I go to docs.microsoft.com and I use the search method here and look for a combo box. Come on, look for a combo box. Okay. And I am looking for system windows controls combo box. Here it is. Then this class combo box is derived, you see it here, from items control. And this items control are controls that can contain multiple elements. So if I go to items control and if we take a look what is an items control? You see that we have so-called selectors. This would be the, the combo box, for instance. But we also have things like a tree view, if you want to display a tree, or a ribbon is also uh, um, an items control. A menu, a pull-down menu is also an items control because you have multiple children there. You have an headed items control that could be maybe a uh, uh, collapse um, control where you have multiple details and you would like to collapse it and uncollapse it and uh, things like that. I think you get the idea. here. If we take a look at selector, what kind of selectors are possible here in WPF? See very famous ones, the list box, the combo box and the tab control. They all are items controls. So whenever you have an items control, you can use items source to set the children based on a data binding. Display member path was used to define the text which should be displayed in the combo box. Next thing that we learned 
is how to implement the iNotify property changed interface. Who can describe what iNotify property changed was used for? Why do we need iNotify property changed in WPF? Uh huh. Perfect. I don't have to. Uh, I don't have to add anything for the students in in home uh, schooling. The, the answer was, it is necessary because the user interface does not monitor the entire time if something has changed. Therefore, we need to poke the user interface and tell it, hey, something has changed. Otherwise, the screen wouldn't refresh. We would change the properties in C-sharp, but, but they would not be reflected on the screen. Correct. I notify property changed. And how do we call I property? No, I, no I notify property changed with this line. Okay. Good. And last but not least, you learned how to launch modal dialogues. And in our case, we again use the data context mechanism in order to set the current car as the data context for the edit car window. And in the edit car window, we used regular data bindings, nothing special, to make the car editable. If you are deeper in both technologies, if you know Angular very well and if you know WPF very well, it might flip so yes, Angular has a lot of details that you have to understand, but once you get a little bit used to these things, Angular becomes simpler for more complex scenarios. So if you build a real world complex app, a system like Angular or React might be simpler than XAML. But to build a simple application like the one that we built now, I am with you. You're correct. It's a little bit simpler building it in XAML than with Angular. So I agree. So, but if you compare it for complex applications, keep in mind it might change. Okay? Yes. Yes, absolutely. You're perfectly right. I mean, take a look at how much code we had to write for styling the application. That would be so much easier and so much clearer if we had CSS for that. So I fully agree to that. And imagine you had to write this code without IntelliSense. That would be horrible. So XML is very chatty. You have to write a lot of text to reach your goals. While CSS is way more compact and way more uh, clear and crisp to express what you really want to have. So I'm fully with you there. So the styling in CSS is, is really shining and we can't achieve as, or no, we can't achieve the same level of functionality and, and clearness and expressiveness as we can with CSS. So we have drawbacks and we have advantages. Some things are simpler, some things are um, a little bit more complex, but in general, the principles of data binding, of having grid systems and things like that, they equally apply to all user interface technologies. Okay, good. With that, we are done with today's lesson. I would like to close by showing you where you can find the ready implemented sample. It's in our GitHub repository, the GitHub repository of this course. So if you go to exercises, you now have, where is it, where is it, where is it? Here, you have this folder. So the, uh, the code that we wrote together today is already in this repository. So for those of you who maybe are absent today, you can always get the code from there. And when, you, when we come to the exam, you can copy code from here if you need to, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's already in your course material. Good. Perfect in time, right? We are done. Thank you for today. See you next week.